Very, very high level, because I think most of what you need to see is in the talks uh, from our team. And hand over to Chris Allen, he'll be uh, talking about uh, work with um, work um, with Glenco software has been doing over the last uh, couple of years. Um, I will try to get done in about 20 minutes, maybe it'll be 25. Then we'll do some questions. Um, we use same uh, methods as before, chat and raising hands. Um, if anybody hasn't found those, just let us know. I'm just trying to get everything set up here. Right. Okay. So um, just a huge thanks to you all for joining us um, this meeting. I have um, to say, I wasn't sure what was going to happen uh, when we decided to try to do a um, remote um, meeting. It's, uh, the turnout has been amazing. So it's great to see you all. Hope you're all quite well. Um, the theme I wanted to really emphasize is the work that OME has been doing talk about the technology, but the ultimate goal is trying to make the data that we are all generating in our labs and our institutions um, uh, truly fair. And um, I'll define that a little bit. Um, it's already been mentioned by um, Helen Parkinson yesterday, but also tell you how we think about um, that. Uh, the background picture there is lovely Dundee late in a, on a summer evening. Um, I wish you could all be here because the nights now are quite something. Um, I hope we can welcome to you, welcome you to Dundee um, maybe then next year or two. So um, first of all, um, quick thank yous. Um, first of all, Wilma uh, Vandenberg and uh, June Matthew help with all the organization. Um, uh, when we decided we had to switch this meeting to remote, um, June asked, what are we going to do? And the answer was, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> We're gonna have to figure it out. Um, and um, so huge, um, huge thanks to her uh, for all her help and um, both Wilma and June for handling all the speakers and um, just a ton of arrangements. Uh, way less physical logistics, but just as many um, issues with arrangements, et cetera. So thanks. Um, also to the team, um, you've met many of them in the um, calls and on the um, video chats. Um, what you're going to see is the work, an enormous amount of work from a very talented team. And I'm just very grateful to have such great colleagues and um, just have such a good time uh, working together. Um, OME has an enormous number of collaborators. These we are trying to kind of work on uh, making this slide. Um, these are people who we've been um, either we have um, joint grants with, or we've been visiting, or they've been visiting us in some way. And so, um, just to thank everyone um, who has contributed. Um, to include all of the names wouldn't fit on the slide, so I've abbreviated them. I hope that's okay. Um, and just to say that we're very happy to uh, continue to expand this list. And if you're interested in um, working, working with us, or us working with you and your colleagues on all of the very, many of the different issues, I should say, that you've been talking about today, um, please, do, um, please do get in touch. Um, there is a bittersweet aspect to this meeting. Um, we're missing one of our dearly beloved colleagues. Um, his name is John Luigi Zanetti. Many of you will have met him at previous meetings. Jean Luigi is an amazing computer scientist um, based at Ceres IV in uh, Sardinia in Italy. Um, he tragically died in a plane crash um, earlier um, in 2019, and we miss him uh, dearly. I miss him greatly. Um, Jean Luigi and I seem to have similar defective sleep patterns, and so. Um, uh, <laughs> And, you know, in, in weird time zones, I would get text messages from John Luigi at weird hours and we would go back and forth. So I really miss a dear friend. So um, this is the standard intro slide for all of the work that we do. In this crowd, I'm not going to belabor this. These images are measurements. We're taking them at scale. 
we're really interested in making these data as valuable as possible and as much as a collaborative, a public, and a uh, reproducibility resource as possible. OME initially and traditionally has defined itself in terms of being focused on interoperability, providing the APIs, the interfaces between all of the different functions you see in the slide. That is the original idea and that's where we focus. But I hope as you've seen, we're working into um, different domains, um, different parts of these domains. We certainly aren't gonna be the ones developing new imaging modalities or great new machine learning tools, et cetera. But we definitely have benefited from a huge amount of work from around the community, um, adopting and integrating all of these various um, uh, capabilities. Um, this slide um, un, um, hides an enormous amount of complexity and something that Helen Parkinson mentioned yesterday, which is that scale matters and scale matters greatly. And so the scale at which you're doing any of these functions is really um, um, uh, driving um, what we've been working on over the last couple of years. So briefly, the technology that we've been um, releasing, Charles, just, just so I don't forget, everything is open source software. Everything is under um, licenses that should allow everybody to um, access our technology. These are various um, specifications and software products um, that um, we build and release to the community. I'm going to really focus on, um, I'm not going to talk anything about OME TIFF. That's been in some of the talks. I encourage you to see them. Uh, I'll mention bioformats and marrow um, and um, IDR. Many of you know about bioformats. We're very proud of the success of bioformats. Um, it's uh, built and maintained by an incredibly dedicated team. It's the core of an awful lot of how people access um, um, biological imaging data um, around the world. It started a ridiculous number of times um, every day. Um, it's based on submissions from the community. The number we talk about is it supports over 150 different proprietary file formats. That's a vast underestimate because it supports many variants of each of those file formats. One to note is 17 different variants of DICOM, for example. It's pl it plugs into lots of different software. It's now um, shipped with an awful lot of open source, but also commercial software. So it's truly everywhere. It's a real success story um, for the open source um, um, community. Um, and I should highlight um, the support that we've had from the Wellcome Trust for continuing to maintain bioformats over the last couple of years. And then most recently, um, support from uh, the Sharon Zuckerberg Commission. Amero is the data management um, system that we also uh, release, kind of typical three layered structure, um, data, data um, sources on the back end, middleware, and then a connection through an internet connection to a wide variety of different client environments. Um, this is a very complex system, it is enterprise databasing. Um, it's fair to say that um, Amero has gone um, pretty wild over the last couple of years. I'll say more about that in a second. It's in a lot of places. So the way we build um, installations for managing data um, in a in research institute or in a data repository, large data sets coming in from many different modalities, going on to large file stores, Critically, the strategy we have used to date is in the native formats as they come on to the come off, excuse me, of the acquisition systems. And we use bioformats as an abstraction layer or an interface that makes a makes gives a single point of access to all of those different um, uh, data formats and data types. And we put a marrow on top of that and provides another interface out to, for example, remote clients, web viewers, um, clusters, and so on. There's an awful lot of technology sitting under here, I'll, which you're welcome to um, uh, the original papers there and there's an awful lot of online documentation. Um, so here's a screenshot of uh, the Amero web client, um, kind of the typical left, middle and right layout, file organization on the left, thumbnails in the middle, metadata on the right. And that, this is you know, a screenshot at, the, at really the top of that um, that tree that I showed you. Um, but because we have bioformats, the same system can, for example, handle the TCGA data set 
images. And one of the key points here is not just that we've got the images, but the, the, the metadata here on the right hand side. So this is Atlas um, metadata coming up. Um, as I mentioned, bioformats can read DICOM, so we can also do the same thing and we can pull in the DICOM tags and store them in metadata um, in a manner. So all of that works. Um, I could tell you everything we've done on Amero over the last couple of years, but um, that would take a long time. This is a list of the releases um, and there's an awful lot here. And so just a huge credit to a very hardworking team um, continuing to develop and um, harden Amero, make it uh, more and more solid and more and more robust. But the, the fact is, is that Amero is now installed in a few thousand sites worldwide. It's being used by many different um, uh, groups. Um, one very important thing that we say in the OMME project all the time is we are not a vendor. <laughs> Don't <laughs> treat us like a vendor. This is a development project. But the fact is, is that this um, software underpins an awful lot of science. These are just a few papers that came out in 2019. I think the thing I'm most proud of as a scientist is the different uh, modality, different imaging modalities, different types of science, different all the way from um, single molecule imaging all the way up to um, uh, whole human imaging. So that's very exciting. Um, and there's now YouTube um, videos online with people talking about how to use Demero. This is from um, NL Bioimaging. Um, and so we find these through Google and they, uh, they appear um, and it's, it's just great to see this happening. So for us, it's a real success story. There's an awful lot more to do though. Um, focus, switching the focus a little on um, fair, fair bioimaging data. So how do we use these tools to make um, data truly you know, available, accessible, interoperable, findable, reproducible, all of these words. And it's funny, I was thinking about how, trying, how to um, introduce this topic. <laughs> and um, I found this graphic on, um, on an EU project site, OpenAir. And so there's, you know, there's a few web pages on, on how to, you know, as, you, as the URL says, how to make your data fair. And um, the diagram, I guess, says it all. I mean, that's all you need to know. Um, I'm being a little facetious um, and, I, and I, I'm not trying to make fun. I think this is actually a deeply serious issue. And um, Helen Parkinson uh, mentioned this yesterday, you know, doing this at scale is seriously difficult. Doing it with bioimaging data in particular, I think as we've all um, discussed is really hard. One thing I want to emphasize, and um, you know, we banged our heads within the project a little bit about this, um, but I think if you ask Chris, um, Alan, you know, he will tell you that um, we've had uh, pharmaceutical companies come to Glencoe, for example, and say, we want to make our data fair. And initially you say, well, wait a minute, you're a pharmaceutical company, what does that mean? You're not publishing the data. Now that's exactly it. They are not making the data fully public, but they are making the data, they, they, at least they aspire to make the data meet the requirements of FAIR for the community that they address, obviously the, um, the individuals in the organization. And I think this is generally true. It's true in institutions, it's true um, in scientific communities, it's true in pharmaceutical companies, it's true in, in technology companies of all types, and it's true um, in our labs. And so behind this representation is an enormous amount of consideration of the different use cases and what it means to make it make data truly fair for the community that needs to access that data. Sometimes it's, it's the global, it's a global scientific community in a truly public way. And sometimes it's a much more defined representation. And so, you know, I'm very, I just want to um, add thanks again to the speakers um, who recorded their talks. I want to emphasize how hard that is. And, um, and if you want to, um, if you want to see what that's like, record yourself um, and then play back um, Play back a talk for yourself. Um, I took several of the talks and classified them in terms of um, the various, you know, the various uh, fair uh, initials. But I also wanted to just highlight that these different, these three different categories that I think are emerging, at least for me, in terms of mechanisms and tools and technologies that we can develop and we can um, deliver to the community. Um, and um, that contribute to, to that overall goal, goal of making data fair. And so there's resources. Note that I've 
put public in quotations because I think exactly what public means gets gets tuned a little bit to different um, um, to different require to different sets of requirements in different institutions. There's tools and workflows, and there's data formats. So I'm going to sort of follow that. Um, um, I'm going to follow that these, these categories um, in the rest of the talk. So focusing on workflows first, um, this will come up in the discussion section and I'm not going to belabor the point. There's some great videos and, and Jean-Marie um, did a beautiful job of showing you what we've been doing. This is the canonical slide of the various tools that connect into Amero. This is work that we're aware of or that we've done. Um, so these all use the APIs from Amero um, in various ways to um, uh, perform um, computation on data stored in Amero. I think what's slightly more interesting, however, is how all of this came to happen, or at least much of it came to happen. Um, Chris is going to tell you about some of the work that they've been doing. I wanted to focus on um, something that we started doing a little over two and a half years ago. Um, so Peter and Jean-Marie and I were sitting in my office, I think in January of 2018, and we wanted to see how different analysis workflows um, uh, would work and if we could present those to people. And so two years ago, after the first OME meeting, um, Peter, I think, went to Dublin. Um, and he's been on the road. There's 23 different sites. So basically, at least one site a month for the last two years all over the world. I apologize to the Americas. We haven't been invited, but let us know if you want us to come once lockdown oh, um, is over. Where we're giving workshops and presenting workflows and, and um, training people how to use um, um, OME's tools and then helping them integrate their own tools. This has been extraordinarily powerful for us. Um, Peter's passport looks um, pretty impressive and he's had a great time. Um, he's been ably assisted by Jean-Marie in some cases and also Will Moore and um, Dominic Linder. But this, um, this crew has just um, had, you know, had you know, really had the benefit of a huge number of contributions um, uh, from many different um, institutions worldwide. We're very grateful for all of the invitations. The content from that has then been turned into um, what we call Amero Guides, and Jean-Marie has been working very hard on this. So, you know, what, what started out as an idea has turned into an awful lot of software and documentation and um, uh, guidelines, et cetera, um, that are all obviously going to be used. On the idea of, the, of publishing data and public data resources, um, the Image Data Resources project we've been working on, the IDR, um, this has all been in the context of um, uh, Eurobio Imaging. Um, I direct you to um, the, um, the really great video from um, and video talk from um, Francis Wong and Sebastian Besson. Um, IDR has been a huge success story for us um, from a pure software point of view. It's us so-called dog fooding our software. We're using Amero and Bioformats to publish um, all of these different data sets. So we we are users and we get to see how this thing works. We're very grateful for um, EBI for hosting this on their um, Embassy Cloud platform. The URL is there and you can find more about all of this in um, uh, the online talk. Lots of different data sets have gone in and this has been great to see. As I said, it tests the, the technology and the software. Um, there's you know, flagship data sets that then get heavily used in a variety of different ways. Um, just, you know, why do you want to make all of this data available? It's just one example. We're taking the raw data from the tissue atlas, from the human protein atlas, and publishing it in IDR. There's about 7,000 antibodies of the 26,000 that um, the HPA has uh, generated. Um, it, but the key is we're taking the images, but also the annotations. So, for example, in this case, the antibody name, the antigen, the gene, um, controlled vocabularies around, if it's appropriate, um, chemical compounds, phenotypes, et cetera. So it's the key point is all of that annotation. Um, this gives us this, the opportunity to start building cloud-based analytics against these, um, um, uh, against these data sets. And critically using um, technology like Jupyter, starting to publish those analytics using the workflows that I mentioned earlier and that I think are in uh, Jean-Marie's um, uh, presentation. So, you know, really trying to close the loop on all of those. Now, I should say we have really dedicated ourselves and bought into this idea of, of trying to understand what idea, where IDR's focus um, is and what it is, what it should be built and targeted for. 
very focused on this idea of an added value resource of highly annotated, highly curated data that in some way is connected to a much larger archive, the bioimage archive that, you, that you've seen in um, Uja's um, Sarkhan stuff. And we, um, you know, and we started actually moving data back and forth between these resources, um, testing the idea of an archive and an added value resource working together. As Shuichi mentioned, and I think was discussed yesterday, we're really excited about working with um, others in the community, and in particular, the um, Shuichi's group at Riken, to build really a global um, uh, resource for these type, uh, a global technology platform for these types of resources. We're putting an awful lot um, into that. That really, um, however, does raise an extremely serious issue. And um, I personally think that this is, you know, this is going to be our mission and this is why we spent so much time talking about this, for example, this morning. If you look at the various resources that were presented um, in the talks um, that are online, as well as many others, I personally am quite concerned that we're, each of us are reaching the level, the, you know, effectively the technical boundaries of what we can achieve. And while each of us will say, well, of course we want to integrate with other resources, um, doing that in a serious way across all of these different data types is going to be quite challenging with the technology that we have. And so we really have to push ahead with new types of technology and new capabilities to be able to, to, to achieve this next level of dreams. And that brings the last topic formats um, um, to the fore. And so um, we talked about that this morning, uh, Josh and Norio and Katarina have beautiful talks um, on the website that you, you can see. This was sort of the decision table about the different types of formats that are out there, at least for the binary structures on the left-hand side and some pros and cons on the right-hand side. It's obviously a very sim simplified and stripped down version of a much more complex analysis. But I think in this bottom left-hand corner, there are now several choices that we, we have to look at and have to bring to, um, into the community, at least for these resources, so we can be um, connecting them and hopefully for our institutional level as well. One thing I would say is we spent an awful lot of time today talking um, quite specifically about binary containers. We are also um, in collaboration with uh, Norio, um, um, Suzanne, um, Katarina, and David. Um, sorry, Norio, Rika, and Suzanne at Osnabrück, and uh, Katarina um, and uh, David at um, UMass working on metadata representations that can work in this new domain. And so obviously we want chunked data, we want that cloud competent, et cetera, but we must have a flexible way of writing down the metadata around all the different domains, experimental acquisition, analytic, et cetera, that we talked about this morning. And we think it's pretty important to connect those with unique identifiers so that if you, if a computational scientist wanted to access, for example, uh, binary masks only, they wouldn't have to suck down the whole um, uh, data vessel. So a lot of work still to do in this, but we're, we're pushing ahead in a variety of ways. So I think this is the last slide. Um, and, uh, you know, I hope you've been able to see the detail behind this talk, this in the, uh, the various presentations online. For you know, speaking for the ONE community, fair, fair data, or in particular bioimaging data, amounts to tra seamless transfer of data, you know, between and among machines and humans, um, and making that um, straightforward, easy. Um, I dare say black box, because I don't think it ever will be, but it um, as straightforward as possible. And picking up on Helen Parkinson's point yesterday, I think the scales that we're now working on and our labs are routinely working on demand a whole new um, uh, mechanisms for data storage and APIs. Um, that's just, there's, um, there's nothing else to say besides we must do this. Um, I mentioned this this morning in a comment. Um, this may be my own um, slightly uh, twisted view of the world, but you know, after so many of us and so many projects have worked really at the grassroots for so many years, in the last, in the last few years, um, we have very mature project, um, technology projects, which is exciting. We have funding, at least some funding for those projects. And we also have these national imaging networks and these national imaging infrastructures. And these are 
platforms and concepts we never had before, um, but they really emerged quite um, rapidly and at, in a global way. And so I think there's an awful, an awful lot of two opportunities there to leverage not only the technology, but also the communities to drive forward um, uh, these capabilities, um, ultimately to deliver more science. So I'll finish there. I hope that was um, not too fast, and, uh, but gives you some sense of the vision we're going on. Massive thanks to the um, entities um, that fund all of our work um, in the UK, primarily to welcome the BBSRC, um, uh, several European projects, uh, most recently EOS Life, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and I should have had it, we have a small, I'm very embarrassed, we have a small award now from the US NIH, which I should have added there, um, apologize. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to take any questions um, according to the schedule. I guess we have two or three minutes left. So if there's any urgent questions, um, otherwise I'll hand over to Chris.